Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Recruiting Workshop for Women livecast training event. We are broadcasting you, broadcasting to you live from San Diego, California, with an amazing studio audience. Please say hello, everybody. <laughs> have been troopers today my goodness we've used you and abused you and put you through all kinds of things you're still here you're doing great and thanks to all of you for tuning in if you're just joining us we are now moving into session five during this workshop and the title of this one is called influencing with integrity how to lead a curiosity based conversational approach to recruiting and with me is a very special guest someone who really needs no introduction but i will introduce him please welcome richard brooke everybody <laughs> All right, I bet most of you in the room know Richard. Most of you watching have probably at least have, have heard of Richard, but in case you don't know a lot about Richard, let me tell you very quickly about this gentleman. He has over 38 years, am I correct? In 30, 39 in two, year, in two months. 39 years in network marketing experience. He started off as a field leader. Okay, we're gonna use this mic then. He started off as a field leader and built a team within three years, I think there was about 30,000 reps, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So had enormous success as a leader first in the field, then moved over to the corporate side and spent several years as an executive and eventual owner of two network marketing organizations. Um, he is also very active in the DSA, the Direct Selling Association, both as on the board of directors and also uh, as a senior member of the DS a ethics committee, which is a very important role in this profession. In March of 1992, Success Magazine featured Richard, Richard on its cover, and I believe it was the first time Success Magazine had ever done a story that put network marketing in a positive light. Is that correct? First and only. First and only time. Wow, you got the, the moment. Um, he's also, also the author of two books that I'm sure you've heard of, the first being The Four-Year Career, which we mentioned earlier. Phenomenal prospecting tool. Get yourself several copies and pass these out to your team. And also, Mach 2, with your hair on fire, the art of vision and self-motivation. You lead a fantastic workshop. If any of you have never been to Richard's uh, Mach 2 motivation and vision workshop, be sure that you check that out as well. And if you have never seen Richard do his super MLM <laughs> man, what is it that you do? 39 I, years, and uh, yeah. that's what I'm famous Say, for, no. super <laughs> MLM man. If you're watching at home, please go to www.blissbusiness.com and find the Super MLM Man videos and register to get more of those. It is the most brilliant thing I've ever seen done in network marketing and direct sales. Nice. Um, would you agree? It sheds such a phenomenal light on both the positive aspect of this profession and also some of the limiting perceptions people still have about it. So thank you for doing that. I know that took a lot of work and it was just brilliant. Yep. So, those of you watching as well, there is an ebook that Richard also just published called The Five Mistakes That Can Ruin You in Network Marketing. And if you're looking on your screen, there should either be a link that you can click to download that, or I'll make sure the chat roll team feeds that link into the chat roll. You'll want to go get yourself a copy of that book while we're speaking. Um, it relates a little bit to what Richard is going to cover here today. So, recruiting. I know for many people getting started and wanting to grow your team, the opportunity to sit down and talk to people can feel a bit daunting and several of you may be using a presentation that your company has provided or some kind of company tool um, but still it can feel a little awkward can it not to share this business opportunity with people in a way that totally gets their attention and helps them really appreciate what it's all about and if there's one thing I totally love and respect and admire about Richard. It's the level of integrity that he brings to this profession, the um, transparency, the authenticity that you represent um, at any point, but particularly when you're recruiting. And you have a way to share this business that I think is really unique and really powerful, and that is so much about this conversational approach to network marketing. So I'm going to let you just take it from here. There's a seven-step process that I know you can share. Please take notes, everybody. Those of you watching at home, be sure you take some notes as well. And I may jump in with some questions as we go. And also, um, we will have a little bit of time at the end of this session for those of you in the studio to ask questions and also those of you at home. So be sure on the chat roll to enter your question and my team will collect it and we'll get through as much of that as you can. You do not want to miss an opportunity to ask this man a question. It's, a, it's an invaluable chance for you to learn a lot about this profession. So I'm going to be quiet and let you do your thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sonia. <clears throat> well, yeah, let me start with talking about Super MLM Man. So um, I had an intuition a few years ago that what I thought the people that were inviting to look at our opportunity thought 
about our opportunity might be missing the mark. And so I got this wild idea to just go interview people, which part of the inspiration for that was, you remember when Jay Leno would go out on the street, you know, and you know, that's sort of the vision I got in my head. And then the more I thought about doing it, the more I thought, you know, this is not gonna be fun at all. And <laughs> so that's why I came up with the Superman, that only came up with Superman so that I would have fun. <laughs> and maybe people would talk to me, but you know, the, I was shocked, and I think I, I did, did the first one of those in Spokane, Washington. We did one in uh, Honolulu and one in Las Vegas, but I think the first one was maybe three years ago. So 36 years full-time in this business, and I was shocked at what I learned from people on the street. And Honolulu was consistent with Spokane, and Las Vegas was consistent with both of them. And what I learned is out of each time we interviewed 30 people, and out of those 30 people, there were only one person that was involved in our profession. There was only two or three that even understood what our profession was, no matter what we called it. So you could call it direct sales, they would think that's Facebook, Nordstrom's, AT&T, or Starbucks, <laughs> even if we called it direct sales. Uh, network marketing, multi-level marketing, nobody really understood what it was, but then the bottom line was, uh, whether they understood it or not, when we finally got to a point where we said, okay, you know, we're talking like Amway. Do you know what we're talking about now? Now, if you say something like Amway, or maybe Herbalife, or New Skin, or Mary Kay, like a really big, uh, legendary company, then they go, oh yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. 98% of the people we talked to did not have a favorable opinion of our profession. And you know, I, didn't, I was shocked that it was that high, and I was really shocked that people didn't really understand what we did. And it just reinforced uh, a philosophy that I've been working on for decades. And um, I'm, I'm not sure I have to work on it too much more because listening to your panelists today, I mean, this is, this is now, the way it's done in our profession. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it hasn't been done this way for 70 years. For 70 years, men have, women may have populated our profession, but men have dominated our profession. And you know, they're generally the biggest money earners, they're the company owners, they're mostly the trainers in the profession, historically. And men are very competitive and they're very dominant. And you know, just heard Josephine and Chris talking about some of why that is. But you know, basically we've just lied and deceived people and beat people up and manipulated them for 70 years. And we're now paying the price for that as we go out just to invite people to the beautiful lifestyle that we have. And of course they don't, they don't get it because you know, they haven't, they haven't been in our shoes. They don't see what we see. They don't feel what we feel. And so it's a real disconnect, especially when you use those old approaches of, you know, let me tell you about my great product. It's the, my, we have the best product in the world. I always want to ask people, how exactly do you know that? <laughs> well, because at the convention last week, they said we have the best product in the world. And you know, we have the best company and we have the best compensation plan. <clears throat> I mean, those are just about the stupidest things anybody can ever say to anyone. The sales force or a prospect. And I don't apologize if I offend you because it's intentional, I guess, if you still do that. <clears throat> um, so, you know, the ladies that you had on the panel, I mean, they just really embody this philosophy, which is, um, you know, just a just a, a an honorable, yes. heartfelt, um, ethical approach to introducing people to what we do, and uh, it works. And it it may not work, maybe sometimes as fast as hyping people and manipulating people, because you know what, people do want to make more money, and they want to look better, and they want to feel better, and they can be manipulated and they can be dominated. But the challenge with that is, you know, if you manipulate people into your business or your product, they're gonna f just sort of find their way out a lot quicker as opposed to if you, 
invite them in and they come in for their own reasons and they come in with some transparency. You heard Kimmy talking about earlier about, you know, we actually tell people up front it's network marketing and I'm not saying that's the smartest thing to do. Uh, we just do it for a reason and we do it because, not that network marketing is the best thing to call it, but it doesn't seem to matter because nobody knows what it is no matter what we call it. <laughs> So we might, we might just call it something, and so we call it network marketing, and, and actually, we don't all do this, but you know, Kimmy and I do it, and we do it just as a practice, as a philosophy, to take a stand and educate people for what we do, and when we tell, tell people we're in network marketing, we don't leave it at that because we know they don't know what that means, so we start listing companies, and we just keep naming companies until they go, I got it. And, you know, the advantage of that is um, transparency and trust. And whether or not from a marketing and sales standpoint, you, you might find it as the, the textbook approach to inviting people, what we have to do for the next 70 years is we have to represent trust. We have to create trust. We have to be trust. And so whatever we have to do that to do that, uh, I, I, that's just what I encourage people to do, is just be transparent, be authentic, and create trust. And trust that that will be attractive. See, we have an opportunity, uh, I think, that's just unprecedented. I don't think it matters what you sell in this room and the listening audiences. It might be, you know, skincare, nutrition, weight loss, maybe some energy some greeting cards, um, but you know, that probably embodies most of it. So just, just think about the public at large. How many people that we're out talking to yes. want what we have? Think about it, if you, ha if you have really good nutritional products, how many people really want better nutrition? They wanna be healthier, they wanna feel better, they wanna live longer. How many people, what percentage? I actually heard the other day it's 88%. I don't know where somebody came up with that, but 88% of the population actually wants to eat better. They want better nutrition. So if you sell skincare, what percentage of the population wants to look better? That's gotta be 102%. <laughs> so if you sell greeting cards, what percentage of the population wants to make other people feel good? That's gotta be 102%. People want our products. Now, are they willing to pay all the time, not all the time, but if you just think about the foundation of what we're selling, people want what we're selling. And then when it comes to the financial opportunity, what percentage of the people want more money? You know, that's a really high percentage. So there's a foundational opportunity that if you just stand in that truth, that people want what we have to offer, you don't have to be desperate. And you can employ some of these techniques that um, some of the ladies talked about, I'll talk about some steps, you talked about some steps, it doesn't matter really what steps you use if you embrace the philosophies. I totally agree. There's yeah, so much to be said about just standing in the value of what you have and yeah. trusting in that. Yeah. Yes, for sure. So in terms of leading conversations, can we go through those seven steps? Yeah. Just to give people some sense, take some notes again, those of you watching. Well, um, the, the first one, which is not new, you've heard about it already today, is it doesn't matter what you call it, we call it connect. Um, and then that's just, um, you know, that could be eye contact, that could be a smile, that could be hi. Those three things right there, uh, that goes a long way to connecting. Of course, if you're doing it on social media, I suppose it's a, I don't know, maybe it's a smiley face or something. I don't, <laughs> I don't do a lot of social media connecting, but. <clears throat> a like, a comment. It sure. is just, it is just connecting. And for those of you that are thinking about this process of inviting people and enrolling people, and maybe it gets overwhelming and you think, oh, I don't know if I could do all those steps. I don't know if I can remember all that. Try this. Like if you're kind of new and you're not, you don't have really feet on the ground, just try this. Just take step one, connect, and just do that. And don't do anything else. Just connect. And let that play out, however it plays out. Anybody can connect, right? Anybody can smile and look somebody in the eye, right? Now, most of us don't, it's kind of cool, you know, if you walk around the world, walk around the airport, 
just noticed how, you know, people would just sort of tend to like, well, we're staring at our phone or we're staring at the ground. And uh, so just, you know, break the mold a little bit. Just look at people and smile and then maybe say hi. And it, it amazes you what will happen. And of course, if you want to take a really big leap, ask people what their name is. <laughs> <clears throat> and, you know, so that's connecting. However you do it, doesn't really matter, but you break the ice, you, you spiritually connect with another human being, and that takes some intent, but anybody can do it, right? So, you know, I use this analogy a lot. Anytime any of you think you can't do what we're suggesting you do, I say you can, and you just have a story that says you can't, and first thing you want to do is change the story. So if I gave you $100 for everyone you connected with in a day, but you had to connect with at least four people or you get nothing, 400 bucks a day, cash, no taxes, could you do it? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, good. So step one's handled. So step two is uh, what we call being curious. And you've heard, you know, you've heard it already, ask people questions, get to know people, build rapport. So this isn't anything new. Um, but I find that by using the word curious, it guides us to be in a state with people, to have a perspective with people. If you are curious about someone else, what, might, what form might the conversation take? If you're curious. And so what I want you, if there's anything that we call this the curiosity coach, we also call this the authentic invite, be curious. And I think like a huge shift that might support everyone in building a be curious. And I think like a huge shift that might support everyone in building a business is do an audit on who are you in the process. Almost every network marketer that you and I mm -hmm. work with, who they are in the process is a recruiter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like how they see the prospect, even if they're using the techniques of building rapport and learning about people and asking questions, who they are is a hunter using very intuitive, soft, leading edge techniques. So I'm asking you questions and I'm listening to you. And as soon as you say the right thing, <laughs> I'm going to recruit you into my business. I just want to comment on that. That is so important though, because people feel your energy. They do you do. agree? You know, it's like you can be saying all the right things. You can think that you're coming from a neutral place, but if you have an agenda when you're speaking with people, they feel it. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember hearing that when I was going through some of the notes on this, and I thought that's just, you know, it's so simple, but it's so important for people to appreciate that. The, the arch of this and why it really works is that you're truly being curious. Yeah. You're really just coming from that place of caring and wanting to know more about that person. Yeah, that's like, that's the shift that makes the difference yeah. is if you are a recruiter who uses techniques, doesn't work. So just try this on, that who you are as a network marketer is curious about other people. If you're curious about other people, you'll do a couple of things. One, you'll ask them questions. And two, you'll tend to listen. It's a great cliche, I don't know who came up with it, but the more you and I talk, the less money we make. In network marketing, the more you and I talk, the less money we make. So anyway, step two is being curious. That obviously reflects in uh, questions. Now, as you've heard from the panelists, when you ask people enough questions, they're gonna feel that the ratio is out of bounds, uh, you know, it's out of weight a little bit, and they're gonna feel a little guilty, and it's not that they're interested in you, they just feel a little guilty, and <laughs> you've asked all the questions. So they're gonna go, oh, well, what do you do? Or where do you live? So they're gonna ask you a question. So if you embrace the philosophy that we teach, what you will be, step three, is candid like brutally candid. And the last thing you will be is cute or creative, <laughs> which I know will offend a lot of people who are very cute and creative. One of my favorites is 
Um, I, I can name him now because he's he is rest in peace, rest his soul. Mark Yarnell, one of the greatest leaders and trainers and authors in our profession. And Mark and I would go toe to toe on this. He's a very good friend of mine who passed away. But <clears throat> Mark would tell people, he'd love to tell people, just because he loved to screw with them, he'd love to tell people when they asked him what he did that he was an emergency retirement specialist. <laughs> And I said, you know, Mark, if you ask me what I do for a living, Mark, if you ask me for what I do for a living, what do you want to know? I know that's like a who's buried in Grant's current tomb question, but if you ask me what I do for a living, what do you want to know? What I do for a living, right? Do you want a riddle? Do you, want, do you want to ask me four times before I tell you? If I ask you what I do for, what you do for a living, I want to know right now what you do for a living. I don't want any mystery about it. I just want to know. So be candid. And you know, you heard Kimmy say earlier, people are going to find out sooner or later that you're in whatever they call it. Whatever they call it, you're in it. So you can tell them later, or you can tell them now, which one do you imagine would create more trust? Well, that, that's the thing, right? Like, as, as innocent as that sounds, right, just couching what you do slightly, it's sending the message that you don't feel strongly enough about it to be completely honest. And people pick that up, it, even if it's not... Um, super obvious to them, they will file that. And suddenly now they're just slightly more on guard, I'm assuming, right? Yeah, they are. It's subtle, but it's, it's really yes. powerful. So complete candor is obviously very important. I'm, you know, I'm not telling you this is the best way to build an organization. I'm not telling you this is the smartest way. This is just a way. This is the way we do it. Um, you might take a clue from, I've been doing this for 39 years full time. I have learned a few things, <laughs> been through a few cycles. I mean, there's even network marketing companies today that swear on a stack of Bibles that they're not a network marketing company, and yet they pay eight levels of commissions. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm not saying that we'll even. That's, I'm not saying that we'll even win this battle. I'm just telling you how we do it. Um, we go for candor because we believe it builds trust, and, and I believe no matter what you call it, if it pays more than three, more than two levels, it's multi-level. If it smells, looks, sounds anything like Amway, it is Amway. <laughs> and different company, maybe different products, but, and what do most people think Amway is? They think it's the, and you know what? We have a lot of fun with it. I actually don't ever get negative responses, even when I tell people, uh, you know, I'm in one of those pyramid schemes on top, <laughs> on top, but I'm in one of those pyramids. They get, they'll go, well, can we, they like it. Can I make a quick comment on that? Because I know, I know you agree with me on this. Um, there is nothing wrong with this profession and the business model that you're part of. Mm -mm. Would you agree? There's nothing wrong. It's a brilliant business model. Um, it's how people have been sharing it that has got this profession into trouble. And it's people who have not been trained well or who are hyping it up or making claims or being um, offensive, you know, when they're approaching people. So, you know, even though we, we are mentioning companies like Amway, Amway is a brilliant company. It's led the field um, for yep. years, you know, led by brilliant people. Um, it's, it's perhaps better known than some because it's been around for so long. Um, and many companies have suffered some level of bad reputation because of some of the leaders in those companies and how they built the business. So um, there's nothing wrong with this profession at all. I think you all agree with that. Um, but I think it speaks so clearly to what you're sharing that sadly, there's been a way people have tried to build this business for years that hasn't been the classiest approach and people remember it, they've been affected by it and it's made it harder than ever um, for people to really see the value in this profession that's really there for them. So I, I so appreciate and love you know, this approach and I know many of you already subscribe to it but I think it's so important if we want this profession to not only survive but thrive that people adopt a, a level of authenticity and honesty that you represent. Yeah, so when people ask you a question in the process <clears throat> what we suggest is just answer it as clearly as possible. Um, you know, you can follow your answer with a question. So, like, once I 
and clear that people understand what we do, I'll ask them, do you have any experience with that? Do you know anything about it? Because I want to know their story. Whatever their horror story is, whether it's their horror story or their brother-in-law's or something they read in a magazine, I want to know all about it. I want to purge, we'll talk about this in a later segment, but I want all of their negativity on the table. I don't want it hidden because if it's hidden, it will shape their decisions and their moves going forward. Whatever issues they have, I want them on the table. I want to be able to address them. So just to clarify that, then um, if someone says, yes, I'm familiar with network marketing or I recognize one of those companies, mm -hmm. you're asking them directly, what's been your experience? Yes. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I, yeah. That's, not a, that's not really a step, but that's just part of when you answer a question, it's really good to follow it with yes. a question. Yeah. So the, the next step is a profound deep dive step in this process, which we call being present, <clears throat> which most people might call listening, um, but most people's interpretation of listening is that they're actually paying attention to what you're saying. So if I'm asking you a question and you're giving me the answer, I would qualify as listening if I'm actually listening to what you're saying. So I'm not talking about listening, I'm talking about being present, which is a different level of listening, if you will, and it looks like this. So almost all of us, when we're talking to each other, like, so if Sonia's talking to me, if I'm typical, 99.99% .99 of humans, when Sonia's talking to me, I'm listening to what she's saying, but while she's talking, I'm having a conversation with myself. <laughs> Maybe none of you ladies do that, <laughs> but I do it. And that conversation would sound like, so maybe Sonia's one of these ladies, which she isn't, but maybe she's one of these ladies that she likes to talk. And it, you know, she has a lot of stories and she has a lot of points and she has a lot of facets to what she's saying. And eventually she's going to get around to making her point. So my listening for her might sound like, yeah, 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 get to the point. And I'll just keep repeating that. That's kind of a conversation I might have in my head while Sonia's talking to me. Or another listening might be that I'm disagreeing with Sonia, what Sonia's saying. So she's telling me all about something, and I'm thinking, well, that's stupid. I don't agree with that. That's like... <clears throat> um, or like another really common one is she's telling me a story and I'm like, oh, I have such a way, way better story than that. <laughs> so hurry up. <laughs> and all she needs to do is go, and I'm right in there with my story, right? So if you want to get a sense of how disruptive this is to communication and being present with another human being, just try, uh, like, in an audible way, like verbally, out loud, say what you're thinking <laughs> while people are talking to you. So Sonia is talking, go just talk to me. Sonia, just go ahead and, I don't know, read one of your scripts or something, or tell me something about anything. Richard, it's been lovely to have you Those are you nice legs you got there, Sonia. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, does that bother you at all? <laughs> By the way, is that the same dress you wore two years ago? On this and it's been great to include you in this training today, and I know you always have something of you all, You know, you always have a smile one. on your face. Dude, how do you do that? You're always smiling. And people so, do feel that. I know. My, I'm totally inappropriate. Like, <laughs> yeah, but, but the point is very valid because People do feel that energetically. Oh, totally they, they feel They totally it. feel that you're not really there with them. Yeah. yeah. So have you ever heard of, or maybe you've met somebody, that your experience of being in their presence is that you were the only person in the room? Like there could have been a thousand people in the room, but when you were talking to them, you were the only person in the room. That's probably somebody that either intuitively or uh, like from a skill set, set standpoint, actually get what it means to be present. And you might think, well, I can't do that. I can't shut that voice off. Yes, you can. You can learn to do it. It's almost in line with meditating. But 
you can learn to do it. And half the battle is being aware, not only of the voice, but being aware of how disruptive it is in connecting with someone. So this may sound like it doesn't have anything to do with uh, inviting people and enrolling people, but uh, it's, it's such a pro has such a profound effect on people. When you do two things with people, when you are naturally and authentically curious about them, like life story curious, like you wanna know everything about them, and you are totally present. Part of being present I didn't talk about was uh, being non-judgmental. So when you're totally present, people can tell you anything. They can tell you all about why they love Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and you may despise Hillary Clinton, and you are totally present. Like, you don't go into judgment. They may love Donald Trump. You don't go into judgment. They may tell you about something horrible that they've done with their life that they don't think is that big a deal. And you don't go into judgment. If you're really curious about people and you're totally present to them, that has the, f the flavor of unconditional love. And they haven't had that in their life since their mom, like probably early, to, until their mom started telling them no. They had unconditional love and the last time they fell in love. So being present, I mean, I could talk about that forever, but the next step is being patient. Um, and is being patient sort of speaks to who are you in the process. So the panel talked about it brilliantly. Um, if, if who you are with the people that you meet is somebody that is looking for friendship, looking for relationship, looking for relatability, for connectedness, and, you're, and it's okay if people don't get in your business or buy your product, um, that's very attractive. And that requires patience. That requires that you don't jump on every opportunity to invite them. And that maybe you even have an exchange and you know it's the time of the exchange is coming to the end, whether it's on Facebook or it's in person and you're, and you're like, oh no, uh, how do I, I need to invite them. I have to invite them. I ha That's not being patient. So if you just trust the process, you're patient. Next step, and I'll rip through these so we can get into Q&A. Uh, a big question that comes up through uh, all of this is what questions do you ask people? And for many, many years, I taught people what questions to ask people. And there's a lot of people that teach people what questions to ask people. And uh, what I would invite you to try is not learning what questions to ask people, but to ask people what questions intuitively come to you in the moment. And don't ever strategize. Don't ever plan. Certainly don't ever set someone up. Like one of my least favorites is, do you keep your income options open? Somebody ever asked me that, I'd probably slap them. <laughs> it's like, really? No, I, I keep them all closed. <laughs> Moron. And um, <clears throat> the, the last, I might have skipped one, but um, you know, most people are gonna say no, even to a beautiful invite. That doesn't mean they don't want our products and they don't want more money. What I think a no means in almost every case is in the moment that you decided, not me as the prospect, in the moment that you decided to invite me to look at your opportunity. I just don't have the capacity to say yes to analyzing it, to evaluating it, to going through the process. I know there's a process. I know that I have to go through your presentation, I have to look at something, I'm gonna to have to make a decision. I know that, I'm not an idiot. And in the moment that you invited me, I got kids, 
I got a spouse, I got job, I got hobbies, I got friends, I got school, I got overwhelm. In the moment that you invite me, I just can't deal with it. And how do I know that after 39 years? Because of the thousands of people who have told me absolutely, unequivocally, on your life, blood brothers, no, not ever. <laughs> and they got in some other deal a week later. <laughs> so most people are going to say no. And you know what? What we get paid for is dealing with that. If everyone said yes, what would companies need us for? They just run a banner on their website. Distributorships available. And they would save 50% of their revenue. We get paid for it. Embrace it. And honor it. So when people tell us no, what I suggest you do, instead of arguing with them and making them wrong, and telling them their job's stupid and they're a loser and they're going to retire broke and their whole deal's a pyramid scheme anyway because it has <laughs> management levels, <clears throat> just honor it. Just let them know very clearly, I hear you, I get it, and I honor it. And you want to watch some magic happen. Instead of closing people, open them by respecting their decision. And what that's going to give you is an opportunity to circle back. Because no doesn't mean no. Mo no means not now. Mm -hmm. It may also mean I don't know enough, but it means not now. And if you think about, if you keep track of all the people that you invite to look at your opportunity, let's just say you invited you know, one person a day for a year. How many people is that that have said no? It's over 300 that have said no. Let's say the rest said yes. 65 said yes, 300 said no. Guess who your best prospects in the world are next year? The ones who said no. The 300 that said no. They are way better than anyone you're going to ever meet if you honored them and respected them and treated them with transparency and trust if you were present for them because they know you. They know what you sell. They know what you do. And you treated them right. Mm -hmm. Best prospects in the world. Well, and it's interesting, in traditional marketing, you probably heard this statistic that they believe it takes at least seven exposures for someone to truly remember or even have some sense of what your product or business is about. So no generally doesn't mean no. It, it means that I need to be exposed again. And by having a classy relationship with people, you certainly do have the opportunity to come back at a later time and reintroduce it and circle back and talk more. And I know we're going to talk about that in the follow-up because you and Kimmy have both had a lot of success recruiting people after several years of cultivating that relationship and ensuring the business. Yep. Thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> so we, we do have time for a couple of quick questions. Do we have any in the studio audience? So we're going to take some off the chat roll here. If you have a question for the legendary Richard Brooke, this is the time to ask it. Go ahead and put your hands up. And on the chat roll, let's see, we have a question here. Let me see. Um, I think I need someone to roll that up. It says, I have a hard time following up, I believe. I give up samples, asking people if they liked it, um, did it work, et cetera, um, and then I get stuck. How do I gain confidence in following up? We're going to talk a lot more about that in one of the future sessions, but do you have any quick thoughts on following up How with people? How do you people? gain confidence to follow up? Well, confidence is a conversation. So <clears throat> if you don't have confidence, your conversation sounds something like, uh, I am afraid if I follow up, they will kill me. I will melt into the earth, never to be seen again, or something like that. So um, <clears throat> this book, mm. um, people tend to think this book is about um, like the motivation of like being excited and like that. It's really not. It's about changing the conversations that you have, which change everything in your yes. life. So yeah. you don't like it's the chicken and the egg. How do you get confidence? You might say, well, go out and do it and you'll get confidence. Well. How do you have a conversation to go out and do it if you have never done it and don't have confidence? It starts right here. So what I would suggest you do is change your vision about 
following up. Mm. It's just a story. Mm. Change the story. How do you do that? Kimmy said it earlier, like the secret. Remember the secret, the, all the big hullabaloo about the secret? They did all that thing about the secret, but then they never told anybody what the secret was, I don't think. I, I didn't, at least I didn't hear it in that thing. <laughs> I think the secret is, Kimmy said it earlier, that the human mind, the part of our mind that's really, really powerful, the unconscious part of our mind, cannot tell the difference between a real experience and one vividly imagined. If there's a secret, I believe that's the secret. And, and I know that is absolutely true. So you can actually write a new story, you can create a new story, and you can tell it to yourself enough with enough powerful, you know, communicative ways like pictures and music and emotion. And, and because the unconscious mind doesn't tell the difference between the story you told it and as though you actually went out and lived it in the moment, it has the same imprinting value. So you could visualize a hundred times following up with confidence, following up with success, following up with grace, following up with fun. And it's as though you followed up a hundred times with grace, fun, and confidence. And that will allow you to step into following up with grace, fun, and confidence. Mm -hmm. Isn't it true, too? I think most people are intimidated by follow-up because they feel so attached to the result. Totally, yeah. And, and they're concerned, um, if this person says no, well, I know what to say. What do I do then? I've lost the deal. Um, versus what I love so much about your approach is I think you have such a long-term vision of staying connected to people and staying connected because you generally enjoy them. There's not always that agenda of I have to get a, a yes to my business. So. I, I would imagine for many of you watching at home, just being willing to circle back and stay connected. And if the business is um, something that makes sense for them and they're willing to look at it, great. If not, um, there's still opportunity to continue with the relationship and, and develop that. And at some point down the, down the way, there m might be a better time for them to take a serious look. Yeah, I just, I don't, I, I think we all, we just need to stay present too. This is our job, folks. And without, without the resistance, so you say, well, I gave 10 people the product and I don't know if they're all gonna like it. And the conversations I have to have, what if they don't like it? And you know, if they all liked it, the company wouldn't need us. Mm -hmm. And actually if all the company had to do was like send out samples and, and even like 20 or 30% of the people liked it and became customers, they wouldn't need us. They need us for those conversations, for the soft art. For the, for the love, for the courage to have those conversations. That's what we get paid the big bucks for. Yes, the relationship. So embrace it, yeah. Yes, absolutely. All right, I think we have time for one question here. Who would love to ask Richard a question about business building, prospecting, curiosity-based conversations? Yes. We have a question from online. From online, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard, what was your biggest mistake that you've made? Oh, what was Richard's biggest? This is gonna take a while. <laughs> <laughs> So what was your biggest mistake? Um, I would as imagine, a distributor, as a company owner? As I, a, I, I would say as a distributor from the field. And what did you learn from it that would benefit people listening? I was such a Neanderthal back then. So <laughs> I never, I, um, well, how, what, or what is the most common mistake you see people making today in the field? Because you do get to, to see that a lot. Yeah, I'll answer her question okay. since she asked. I want to make sure. Uh, it took me two and a half years of fighting the, um, the idea that personal development was my ticket out. Two and a half years I fought that. Two and a half years I thought, I can, I can work my way through this. I can persist my way through this. I don't actually have to change who I am. And it didn't work, and I ended up losing my home, two cars, and my sister's sitting here in the back. I mean, I slept on my sister's couch for six months. And, <laughs> and the only way I was, she was a flight attendant, the only way I could work the business is I would, the business is I would take her to the airport when she flew, and then I would drive the wheels off of her car for three or four days doing meetings, and then when she came home, I just sat on the couch, because I had no money, I had no car, 
that's how far I had to get down before I realized I just wasn't smarter than the people that were coaching me. And, you know, oddly enough, it's kind of ironic, but we tend to resist people who have made millions and millions and millions of dollars doing this. And we have the greatest system in the world. We have multi, multi, multi millionaires in every company who will tell you exactly how you do it and they'll coach you and they'll partner with you and all you have to do is do what they tell you to do. And, you know, find your own way and your own voice and your own style, but don't miss the basics. And I just resisted personal development ferociously. I picked up Think and Grow Rich and I just hated it. <laughs> and it took me a couple of years before I, but once I started, um, you know, three, four months, I, I was visibly different. My energy was different. My voice was different. My confidence was different. And, you know, some of you may have heard my story about, you know, I, I wouldn't even probably be here except for one day in my career where I sat in front of a prospect and it was all a series of stories I told myself that put me in front of that prospect. And when he asked me if there was any money in this, it was a story I had told myself that gave me the answer. And that one guy, his name is Jerry Schaub, he still lives in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. In 1979 and 80, before probably a lot of you were born, he made me $100,000 in one year. That'd be like 400 grand today from one person. And that all happened because of about three or four months of personal development. Wow. So on that note, because I believe that truly is the biggest payoff of this business, would mm -hmm. you agree? It's who you become as a yeah. result of doing this business. And it, it is um, the price of admission to get in the door. You can't fake it. You can't buy your way in. You can't steal it. You have to earn it. But if you're willing to invest in yourself, and you certainly have, I mean, you've, I'm sure, grown tremendously from the very first days when you started to who you've become today. Um, you know, it, that's what has drawn me to support people in this profession. It's who you become as a result of doing this business. That is the true payoff, the real gem. And you, sir, are the best representation of that. So thank, thank you, you so for being here. Give yeah. my hand, everybody.